Thank you, Terry. Um, it's my real honor to introduce our keynote speaker, E.J. Dion. I'm fairly new at this uh, virtual meeting stuff, so I'm taking it on faith that he's somewhere in the wings ready to go. You don't want to have to hear me give his speech. Um, I'd like to tell you how I first met him. I was serving on the advisory board and governance studies at the Brookings Institution, and uh, EJ is a senior fellow there. Well, when I was fairly new there, I sat down next to him at one of the meetings, and he said, so Howard, where are you from? So I said, well, I'm from a little town outside of Providence called Rehoboth, Massachusetts. You've probably never heard of it. And he said, my mother taught at Dighton Rehoboth High School. And that just wowed me. It is indeed a really small world. Um, I'd like to now just hit some of the high spots on what is a, a very, very long um, resume. And I'm not going to bore you with them, but I'm going to give you uh, several of the high points. EJ has a BA from Harvard, and he was Phi Beta Kappa. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He served 14 years at the New York Times with stints in Rome, Paris, and Beirut. Uh, EJ is a syndicated columnist. Uh, he writes for the Washington Post, where he works now. And his column uh, is carried by over 100 newspapers on a weekly basis. Uh, he's also a professor at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in uh, Governance Studies. He appears very regularly on TV, on PBS, on NPR, on um, MSNBC, and on several of the, uh, the network news shows. He's a, a very busy guy. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and those are just the high spots. I could go on for 20 minutes reading you all the awards and the claims that he's, he's uh, received over the years. Uh, I, I have to, could, would be remiss in not mentioning that he's uh, a, an author. He has written several books over the years. And his current book, which came out this year, is Code Red. How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country. Again, that's newly out there and a, a great read. I encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, with that, I would like to um, introduce him. But first, I want to mention how glad I am to be able to introduce him and how glad I was that I sat down next to him those years ago in Washington. And I know you're going to like him just as much as I do. And with that, I'm Proud and honored to introduce E.J. Dion. E.J., welcome. I see you there, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, what a wonderful, warm uh, introduction, Howard. Why, you're one of the reasons I'm here, because I would have been so grateful to be your friend and for the uh, uh, partnership you've had with Brookings. Uh, I, in that same conversation, I said, you know, Rehoboth is one of those places I always thought I wanted to live. It is such a beautiful town. And I want to say that the other reason I'm here is the part of the world that you are trying to lift up is the part of the world that shaped me. As some of you there know, I grew up in uh, Fall River, uh, Massachusetts, which is over a state line, but is part of the same region. And I always tell people that so much of what I think, so much of what I care about, uh, so much of what I think about how the problems that we need to solve as a country come from growing up with that in that great old mill town. Um, and what I want to talk about a little bit today is how um, what you are doing for towns like Fall River, places like Central Falls, like Woonsocket, like Pawtucket, um, are things that really need to happen all over the country. Uh, and so you are pioneering in Rhode Island some of the work that needs to be done in so many other places if we're to heal the deep divides in our country, uh, both along economic and regional lines, but also along political lines. Um, the other reason I'm so happy to talk with you is I'm accustomed to covering national politics and politics uh, in Washington, which, uh, as I think most of you know, uh, are not particularly rewarding for our country uh, these days. 
um, that politics, I've always thought that politics ought to be about solving problems uh, and resolving disputes. And what we are seeing now, unfortunately, is just the waving around of, of issues and divisive flags uh, in ways that have nothing to do with solving problems and everything to do with dividing us uh, further for political purposes. So I want to salute all of you for working uh, together uh, across lines to solve problems. And I just want to lay out a, a few thoughts uh, on what I think, where I think your work can go and some hope I have actually for the country um, going forward. In many ways, uh, what I have to say um, is uh, uh, going to be along the lines of my, what my friend uh, Jim Fallows told you uh, earlier uh, last year. Um, Jim, I understand, gave a great speech, and I'm not surprising Jim and Debbie, his wife, because they've done extraordinary work in this area. I just want to say one thing. Uh, I understand I'm chatting with my dear friend Scott McKay after I finish my brief talk here. Um, political predictions will come up, I suspect. Uh, I always tell people that I resigned uh, my membership in the prognosticators union at around midnight on election night uh, in 2016. But you can't chase the bookie from the track. Uh, we still all want to make some predictions. So I will hold aloft of, uh, something that one of our daughters gave me. My prediction is Celtics in seven. We have a ways to go, uh, but uh, I still think we'll get there. I, I don't know about you, but I love this particular. Uh, I've always loved the Celtics, but I really love this team. So let me start with livability itself. I think livability combines the best of conservative and progressive ideas. Livability is fundamentally uh, conservative uh, because it involves revering what you have. It involves preserving beauty. It involves preserving the environment. I know that uh, conservation in, and environmentalism is not seen as conservative these days. But look at the root of the word conservation. Uh, conservation and conservative have uh, the same root. Um, it involves preserving great old buildings and great old neighborhoods. It involves using the infrastructure you have so you don't have to spend tax money to rebuild it. It's one of the great reasons why you want to go into older places that have built out so many resources that you don't have to rebuild again. But yes, it's progressive. Um, it's progressive, obviously, because you have to embrace creative uses of government uh, to go forward. You can't just be anti-government and expect to solve problems. Um, you have to um, uh, help lift people up who have been left out um, and left behind. Um, you have to um, embrace public action. Um, you have to remember, and I'm going to get back to him, uh, something that Robert Kennedy said that always struck me, perhaps because I grew up in a town that uh, had been has been hit over and over again by unemployment. He said, the unemployed have nothing to do, which means they have nothing to do with the rest of us. We cannot, uh, in a good country, in a just country, in a productive country, um, allow, leave so many people without the resources to lift themselves up. Uh, and that's what this movement is about. Uh, secondly, and this has become a cliche in your movement, I know, but sometimes cliches become cliches because they're true. Um, and one of the cliches I most identify with is think about assets, not just problems. Uh, abandoned mall, uh, mill buildings, those sound terrible. Ab abandoned mill buildings are absolutely wonderful constructions. And we've seen towns all over the country from Buffalo to Lowell um, and many other parts of the country put these glorious old buildings uh, to great new uses. So we've seen some of that in Fall River, where I grew up, and we need to do uh, more of that. Think about assets. Um, uh, I think about um, industrial history as an asset, as a legacy uh, to build on. There's a lot of interest around the country in figuring out how we got to where we are now, including the years of enormous creativity and in industry. Uh, industrial history is an asset. Um, it brings people into communities. 
Uh, think about local ethnic cultures as assets. Uh, boy, do we have that in abundance in our part of the world. I still think of, of uh, Southeastern and New England as us. Um, uh, and then remember the arts and remember the, these buildings. Again, to go back to the mills, these are buildings that can be repurposed and are far less expensive than uh, buildings in great metropolises. Uh, Jim Fallows and uh, Debbie uh, have made a point of uh, calling out the fact that artists are often leading indicators and leading forces uh, for urban redevelopment. I know that's happening in some of the towns uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, again, we can think about all of these uh, things as assets, and so is a less expensive housing. Uh, this is all assets. I, uh, fourth, I want to talk about um, tax credits. Uh, I love historical tax credits too, but I think it's very important not to be limited to tax credits in our imagination here. We really do need overt public investment itself. Uh, tax credits are no substitute for that. I want to shout out community colleges, which all of you know are great sources of growth. Um, I want to shout out parks and libraries. There's a wonderful project uh, that I look, I think all of you might take a look at called Civic Commons, um, which is pioneering the use of parks and public libraries to uh, promote both economic development, but also uh, to build civil society, to build community in places as diverse as Akron and Detroit and Philadelphia. Um, I think we need public investment as well as very carefully targeted uh, tax credits. And then the fifth is let's build civic society, build civic capital. We are really rich in our part of the world in great old organizations as well as new ones, veterans groups, unions, chambers of commerce, credit unions, churches, synagogues, mosques, we have a lot of great old civic organizations. We need to help them and also develop the civic organizations of the next generation uh, and, um, uh, and the next uh, period. And I have to tell you about transit, uh, which is number six on my list, but very high. And in general, um, North Atlantic Rail sounds like a great idea to me in my dear hometown of Fall River would be transformed with greater train access uh, to Boston. Uh, transit, as Scott noted, is in trouble now. Um, I think the short, in the short term, preserving what we have, not letting the uh, problems created by the pandemic wash away real public resources we have built. Uh, and in the long run, so I think you would need a short run strategy to preserve and then a longer run strategy to build and expand. Um, regionalize. Um, Barney Frank, the congressman from, uh, uh, former congressman, used to represent at different times all or part of Fall River where I grew up. And some of you obviously from the area know that the two public high schools are Durfee and Fall River and New Bedford High School in New Bedford. And they have a great football rivalry. And Barney used to sit down with local officials and say, you can't look at community at economic development like a Durfee New Bedford football game. This cannot be rivalry. If places like Fall River New Bedford over your state line and Central Falls and Pawtucket and uh, Woonsocket um, all see each other as adversaries and competitors, um, we will beat each other's brains out to no effect. I know you guys are working on this, but I think we have to think of ourselves uh, as a region and realize uh, that we will all rise or fall as a region. You can just look at our unemployment rates. Uh, they tend to go up and down uh, together. So I want, I, I think uh, Barney's lesson is with us. We can't, uh, a couple more points I want to make. Um, we cannot um, look at this effort as just an attempt to bring cool new people uh, into an area. Um, I think that, as you all know, in these efforts, there is enormous conflict over gentrification. Um, and, you know, development uh, is in one person's eyes can be gentrification in another person's eyes. 
Obviously, we want regions that have been suffering economically to develop an attractiveness to new people and new energy. It's good when new people are moving into a place, but we don't want that movement to be experienced by the people who are already there as an effort to push them out or as privileging uh, the more affluent new over the people who were there already. And so I think it's also essential that regions like the uh, southeast uh, of New England um, and regions like it all around the country uh, need to think about how to lift up uh, the people uh, who are already there, uh, who have been battered by economic change over the years, who are also assets uh, to a region. And when people talk about uh, education and training, it bothers me sometimes that uh, it sounds like fairly elite people looking at uh, people who have worked all their lives with their hands and in factories and saying to them, well, you got to go back to school. you got to be just like me, the person who went to college. That's not what training is about. What training is about is a new economy where new jobs are being created and the opportunity is there. Uh, for people without college degrees to grab economic opportunity. And so I love what uh, Richard Cordray, a, a candidate for governor in Ohio, who uh, lost, alas, from my point of view, but I think he put it really well. He said, you shouldn't have to go to college to join the middle class. And the whole appeal of training is not telling people you got to be like some elite class. It's telling everyone you have assets uh, and that everybody, government, just like government is committed to public education, government needs to be committed to help everybody make the most of the assets they have. Um, build back better. It sounds partisan because that happens to be Joe Biden's slogan. But I happen to love that slogan, and it's not new at all. It is the slogan of movements uh, uh, for redevelopment after disasters. And surely the COVID disaster and the uh, economic uh, disaster that's accompanied it create uh, real problems for our country that we must solve, but also real opportunities to do things better uh, the next time. Uh, it has sort of called out to us the inequalities we see in the country, where some people, those of us who can work on these screens we're looking at are just fine. A lot of other people are either unemployed or they have to use, uh, they have to risk their lives in order to work. We need to lift them up. Um, we can use the opportunity to rebuild the economy by making investments in green energy, in green industries, more greater investments in uh, education access, yes, greater uh, investments uh, in transit. I think we have to look at the rebuilding effort after COVID uh, as a great opportunity for places like those you are concerned about uh, to uh, emerge better uh, after a great challenge for our country. And last, I'm going to turn really spiritual on you. Um, you know, I was thinking about this talk and three words came to mind. And the words were faith, hope and love. Uh, I think that we need to be inspired as you are by love of particular places, love of particular patches of the world that mean a lot to us. There is nothing wrong with loving the place you're from but nothing wrong with loving a particular place and wanting to lift it up. Indeed, I think that kind of love is essential uh, to rebuilding our country piece by piece all across uh, our great nation. Uh, secondly, we need to have hope that our efforts, however challenging the problems are, uh, can bear fruit. And I think you can see already uh, in your state, um, and we can see it in parts of the country, and Jim Fallows and Debbie, talked about those signs of hope that we've seen uh, all over the country. Um, you can see those signs of hope. Remember, hope is not a feeling. Hope is a virtue. Um, you need hope in order to move forward. Without hope, there is no moving forward. Um, and last, we need faith in each other. And that is why I really hope that this nasty, brutal form of politics, a winner-take-all kind of politics, uh, comes to an end. Uh, we are better than this 
as a country, we can look at each other and think of something other than red and blue. We can look at each other and see something other than just race or religion and decide that these things should divide us. We got big problems. We can't afford these divisions as a country. Um, We need, as Robert Kennedy uh, said, we need to have imagination uh, to deal with the lack of hope uh, in so many of our communities. He said that when he was setting up a great project in Bedford-Stuyvesant uh, in New York many years ago. Uh, you guys, uh, all of you involved in this movement, give me hope, uh, give me greater faith in the country, and you love the same part of the world that I am very devoted to. And so I want to thank you for your work, and it's a real joy uh, to be with you today. I only wish I could be visiting in person, but I'll be back there soon. Thank you so very much. Jay, uh, terrific, inspiring, insightful uh, remarks and uh, a real catalyst for for action and for uh, us to um, continue to build bridges and to be imaginative and to uh, uh be uh, open to faith, hope, and love, uh, as you put it. Uh, uh, so uh, we want to explore. What's that? Oh, I, I said I you couldn't did. resist. It's what the spirit moved me, and it's what came to mind when I was thinking about what you guys do. <laughs> the, you have. I hope we're we're worthy of those great uh, tributes you played, you, you you made to us and 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 to the region, and we're certainly working hard to uh, to be worthy of, of those uh, of those uh, uh, plaudits. Um, so we want to explore further uh, with a distinguished group of panelists uh, your key messages. And in order to do that, I want to pass the baton uh, to a veteran political journalist and commentator. Uh, most of you in the region would know him, will know him, Scott McKay. Scott's going to moderate a response panel discussion to EJ's uh, very inspiring talk. Now, Scott and I go back at least 33 years when, as a uh, young pro Joe political reporter, uh, he spent a little time amongst, amongst his many duties covering my first close but no cigar run for Congress. Uh, fast forward to the present, and Scott is sharing his political and policy wisdom regularly as the public radio's chief uh, political analyst. Scott, thanks much for being with us today. and. The floor is yours. Thank you so, so much. I just want to quickly introduce the panel here, uh, E.J. Dion Jr., and we have something in common, which is we both grew up listening to Johnny Most, and we thought Bill Russell's first name was Rebound Russell. And the Honorable Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, U.S. Senator, Allison Goble, the Executive Director of the Greater Ohio Policy Center, and, of course, Scott Wolf, the executive director of Grow Smart Rhode Island. I think we're going to start quickly here with EJ. Just how does growing up in Fall River, how did that inform uh, your shape your views of life and politics? Oh, thank you. I, I'm going to be brief because I really want to hear from this great panel of yours. I just want to say, obviously, growing up in Fall River gives you, uh, and, and also, by the way, rooting for the Red Sox in the days when I grew up there, uh, gives you a, a, a really strong sense of rooting for underdogs, understanding that a place can be very, you know, a down on down in the economic scale and still be very rich in community, very rich uh, in people in civic action, very rich, obviously, in politics. I think politics was one of the biggest industries in Fall River. Um, the late Mary McGrory um, once said that every baby born in Massachusetts is born with a campaign manager's gene. And I think that's true in Fall River. Um, but I looked at my parents and their friends and the people around them, and they were very, very devoted to a place. They really cared about the community. My mom was a teacher and a librarian. Um, and so what I saw is a place that really wanted to lift itself up by itself, uh, but also a place very aware that collective action, unions, some help from government, 
a collective action was necessary to move forward. Um, and obviously, it was a very religious place, and uh, Fall River was predominantly Catholic, but I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, so I learned about the importance of religion and the importance of brotherhood and sisterhood across uh, religious lines. So those are some of the things I learned uh, growing up in Fall River. Thanks for asking. Are we still connected? Hello? Five? Oh, okay. Yes, so uh, guess what I'm interested in? Is it's great to have regional cooperation uh, for economic development. But sometimes the reality is that we have local rivalries. New England's very parochial, as we all know. And in Rhode Island, we just saw our beloved AAA baseball team, the Pawtucket Red Sox, move to Worcester, just up the road, uh, where they're going to move to a new stadium, and they got some economic incentives to do that. And, you know, this is a bigger state. Massachusetts has more money than Rhode Island. They were able to do this. And I'm just wondering, is this ever going to stop or are we just going to keep go. poaching? Are we just going to keep poaching each other's assets in these small New England states? Uh, Who wants to take that one on? Scott Wolf? Well, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, well, I think. Uh, I think we've got a mix of uh, of uh, wasteful rivalry and some creative collaboration uh, when it comes to the regional scene. Uh, to to look at the glass as half full, uh, one uh, example of good regional collaboration is this emerging coalition for a new high speed rail network that would be transformed for. For the region, especially for our some of our post-industrial legacy cities like uh, Pawtucket and Woonsocket uh, uh, and uh, uh, their counterparts in in uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut, so I think that's one positive uh, example. Another sort of micro example of good regional collaboration is uh, in the, the the neighboring cities of Pawtucket and Central Falls. They have joined together uh, with a joint planning commission to chart out uh, effective uh, redevelopment of their new commuter train district. And um, certainly are encouraged by that. I think we're seeing a new generation of leaders emerge in, in some of, our, at least in some of Rhode Island cities who are more aware of the value of, of collaboration and are understanding that they can't go it alone and, and thrive. So. But yeah, you're right, Scott. There's still that parochialism. It still has to be uh, overcome, and people still need to understand it's in their enlightened self-interest to cooperate regionally. I wonder, we have Senator Whitehouse here. What role can the federal government play? Some of us feel you really haven't done much of anything. We talk and we talk and we talk about infrastructure. What help can the federal government do to help these urban areas? It seems like Republican states and Democratic states, red and blue, both have the same problems, crumbling infrastructure, roads and bridges failing, uh, a resistance to investing in new ways of doing things, green energy, all of these issues. Is there any hope, Senator? Oh, I think there's lots of hope. Um, but before I get into some hopeful things, let me welcome EJ to our Rhode Island call. He is kind of a living national treasure and is a, a distinguished member of the uh, Fourth Estate with Fall River Heritage. He's kind of the national version of our own Charlie Baxt, um, and it's great to have him on the show. And if you, Scott McKay, uh, have only known Scott Wolf for 33 years, I'm going to be very surprised. <laughs> I would have put it more at like 43, 53, but I'll take your word for it this time. 
So, yeah, there's a lot that can be done. And I think um, we see a lot of it in big infrastructure bills. Um, if you look at the uh, viaduct and 146, two pretty key thoroughfares, um, those are being upgraded because the federal government dumped, in each case, $60 million into those uh, projects to accelerate them um, going forward. Um, I think the federal government has a critical role in offshore wind to try to get the licensing squared away. We showed the federal government how to do it in Rhode Island, and then they couldn't figure out how to do what we did. So they're bollocksed up, but we hope to get that uh, unsnarled. Um, I'd add Reggie as a really good uh, example of regional collaboration, the Regional Greenhouse Gas uh, Initiative. And I'd add that Mayor Diosa and Mayor Grebian are also working to um, solve the pandemic together, almost like co-mayors for their uh, very for their neighboring uh, cities. So there's a lot of good stuff going on. The federal government can support it, but local choice is incredibly important. As EJ said, every place has a sense of place. New England has more sense of place than any place. And the people who are the local guardians and custodians of that sense of place need to have their voice not just heard, they need to have their voice be the determinative voice. Let's go to Allison Goble. Thank you very much, Senator. You represent uh, the Greater Ohio Policy Center, and of course, uh, we know Ohio is the middle of the Rust Belt, and you've got many of these cities out there, the Youngstowns, and what works in Ohio that you think could be translated to New England in helping some of these older cities get back on their feet? Yeah, great. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. So um, at our organization, we look at um, how legacy cities, Rust Belt cities, are uh, transforming themselves. And we look nationally so that we can bring it back to Ohio. So I'm happy to share some of the things that we're learning um, that you might be able to carry forward in, in Rhode Island. So, you know, finding common ground, of course, is really important. Um, any developer could we have a building or a local government can put in a streetscape, right? But sustaining that revitalization work is really, um, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? So um, for us, we really um, are starting to emphasize with our communities across Ohio, the importance of trust building. And some of the things that were just discussed, right? Like um, leaders who've been in their position a long time are retiring and a new sense of collaborative spirit emerging, that we are seeing that and encouraging that um, a real sense of, of a need for um, a regional approach to shared challenges. That's also something that we are encouraging um, communities to, to work through. But in order to actually you know, arrive at a, a memorandum of understanding or an actual project, you have to have trust as a foundation to that. So, uh, and that's trust among the grass tops as well as between you know, grass tops and grass roots. Um, I wanted to just share maybe two examples of things that I think um, that I've been really impressed with lately that I think could be replicated in any context, whether it's a small or a large legacy city. So the first is a pre-pandemic example, but I do hope that we can all get back to it eventually, which is that um, there, was a, there was a neighborhood here in Ohio that is about to experience a lot of investment. And um, this neighborhood has historically been underinvested for many years. And so as these new investments come in, which includes uh, housing and potentially a grocery store uh, and small business assistance, neighbors needed to understand what, what was coming, how it was actually going to benefit them. And so the investment group worked with, um, and uh, hospitals involved as well. So the investment consortium worked with a local community development group to um, set up monthly open houses where senior leaders from each of the partners of the investment group set up tables and were available to answer questions and receive feedback. And that serves direct um, access to decision makers within the investment team really has started to bring the community along and give them the, the comfort level that they needed and the trust level that needed to happen for, these, for this project to really sustain in the long term. Since the pandemic has started, of course, community outreach has been um, uh, has looked differently, and trust building has looked differently, especially for communities that are, um, you know, on the wrong side of the digital divide. So, um, you know, some of this is just old school community organizing, still knocking on doors. Um, we have communities around Ohio that are um, using to community development organizations and needing resource bags or um, gift bags where there's little toilet paper and some flyers and you know, information to be shared um, 
with the neighbors so that people still feel connected even if they're unable to attend a, a community meeting. We think that, um, you know, what we're seeing right now, I also kind of want to circle back to some of those comments about the federal government. So Senator, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're fighting for these issues. Um, what we've seen in legacy cities across the country for the last 30 years is that those places that are thriving are those places that have decided we're just going to figure it out ourselves. And um, we, they certainly look to the federal and state governments to help give them support. But um, those places that are waiting for some sort of solution to come in and fix it for them are the ones that are still struggling. Whereas those places that have said, you know, we got to do this ourselves. We have got to put aside whatever sort of animosity or tension that may exist between organizations. We got to put that aside for the greater good. Those are the places that really are turning around. It's demonstrable both in hard data as well as just the feelings on the ground. So um, anyway, kind of jumping all over the place, but wanted to make sure that we recognize that there is still a lot of energy and possibility in our legacy cities, even as right now is a, is a really hard time to keep all that moving at the same speed as it was before. Thank you so, so much. I guess what I want to do is go back to the panel uh, and talk briefly about what COVID-19 is doing to the nature of work. We look uh, at downtown Providence, we look at Boston, and we see an awful lot of empty office space. And this is happening around the country. You talk to lawyers, well, they don't, they're not in their offices every day anymore. People are working from home. And I'm just wondering, let's start with you quickly, EJ. Is this a long-term trend? Is this something we should be worried about? Uh, that people will work remotely more? I think it's a long-term trend, but it's also it's not necessarily something we need to worry about. Um, one, there are certain good things that can come out of this. Good thing one is a whole lot less commuting and a whole lot less um, uh, uh, fewer pollutants in the air, less carbon in the air. Uh, it's remarkable when you look at some of the numbers in this period uh, around the world, uh, there are uh, ways in which, uh, from the point of view of air pollution, this has been, uh, and, and climate, um, this has shown us we, that that reductions are possible, change is possible, but not at, we, obviously not at the cost that we are paying uh, economically. Um, second, I think it could end up being a particular asset to medium-sized places, like the places uh, that you are talking about, whether we're talking about Youngstown or Parma or Toledo, a lot of great cities, smaller cities in Ohio, or uh, you know, Central Falls, Pawtucket, Woodsocket, Fall River, New Bedford, places in our region. Sorry, I keep dragging Massachusetts in here. It's just, uh, I can't not. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that these places will be attractive. But thirdly, um, I think that after, you know, we've got to beat back COVID for good and actually get eventually a vaccine that actually works, not one that is said to work um, and, you know, that could take us a while. It could take us another year. I think there will be some work that will not be in offices uh, to the degree that uh, it is now. But I do think urban places um, uh, will remain attractive to a whole lot of people. A pandemic does not destroy all the reasons that cities grew uh, over uh, the last uh, 10 or uh, 15 years, uh, whether it's community or the arts or a concentration of people with talents who need to work together, particularly in the uh, tech world, obviously also in the arts. Um, so we will have a reorganization of work I think we'll have to deal with. I think some of this will be an asset. It could also be an asset, uh, by the way, in childcare if we organize it right in helping parents um, uh, who need to spend time, some time at home um, but, uh, you know, I think it will be a challenge uh, to uh, real estate uh, folks. Um, but I think we got to figure out how to take what is a now, I think, inevitable uh, and trying to get the best out of it and pushing back against uh, some of the costs. You know, one of the beauties and also the bane of New England is our respect for the past. We're kind of the nation's addict. We're big on historic preservation. We're deeply rooted here. But sometimes that attitude can also lead to 
We don't want anything to change. Good Lord. You know, that golf course has been there for 100 years. I'm talking about Metacommon in East Providence. And right now there's a huge fight going on. It's no longer viable as a golf course. And there's talk about mixed development, some housing there. And the neighborhood, they don't want to change. They have had this green space there for years. And they don't want more traffic and things in their neighborhood. And I'm just wondering, writ large, how we settle these kinds of problems. Maybe Scott Wolf, you've known Rhode Island pretty well. Maybe you start on this one. I used I used to play golf at Metacommon as a kid too, so <laughs> I know the layout pretty well. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, uh, some of this gets down to design and and not approaching development as a and, and conservation as a black and white scenario where you either develop a piece of land fully or you conserve it fully. There are ways to do both on the same piece of land. There's a technique called conservation development that a member of our staff is an expert on uh, in which you can have residential development that still preserves more than 50% of the the pristine land uh, on which the development may be occurring in a pristine state. So I think we have to try to be creative about our approach to development and conservation. I, I also think that, as, as I think EJ mentioned, redeveloping historic buildings is not, a, um, is not a regressive action. It's a very progressive action. It's taking your existing assets and repurposing them as opposed to being wasteful and uh, tearing up farmland or forest land in the suburbs or uh, new construction, often ugly new construction. So I don't think all of our um, uh, our attachment and reverence for the past is a bad thing. And, and from a tourist standpoint, tourism standpoint, one of the one of the sayings I've always liked is that people from anywhere USA come to Rhode Island because we're not anywhere USA. So maintaining that distinctiveness and that uh, heritage, while at the same time being open to creative, well-designed new development uh, and rehab development is, is the ideal formula. It's easier said than done, but I think we've got a number of examples of that being successful in the state. Let's Sean, take a look at something real quick. AJ. I love your... I love your attic metaphor, but it may carry, a, it shouldn't carry a purely negative a- aspect. I was thinking about the new popularity of vinyl, uh, where all the old records people used to have in their attics, those were just old records that were out of date. Suddenly, vinyl is really cool. It's sort of retro cool. And I think that when you think about older places, there are things that 20 or 30 years ago we said, oh, that's old stuff and, you know, forget about that. And now we look back and say, wait a minute, uh, we're glad that stuff wasn't knocked down. We're glad that's sitting in our attic. So I think we need to look at both sides of your attic uh, metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Well, well, I guess the, the other thing I'd like to ask the panel, maybe Senator Whitehouse, we haven't bothered him too much this morning. <laughs> You know, it's wonderful to have uh, community redevelopment, but how do we protect what we have? In other words, we just don't want every neighborhood to become like Fox Point on the east side of Providence, where, you know, you had one ethnic group, working class neighborhood that's now basically a student ghetto and the hip wazee uh, have moved in. And of course, there's all kinds of nice restaurants. It's a wonderful place, but it doesn't have the same ethnic background. And we see what gentrification does. It seems to push some of the working class folks out of the neighborhood and bring in this new group of folks who didn't grow up there. And some of them are artists and and they're restaurateurs and they bring great things to the neighborhood, but inevitably it changes it and it brings it more to a theme park type neighborhood than a real living working neighborhood. Yeah, I think that's the um, contest you have. Um, People are going to make their choices in the ordinary course. And what is once beautiful and special and has a an extraordinary um, local population that that has a history there that moves on. 
And if you try to disnify it and preserve it, um, you end up with a simulacrum of the real thing, not the real thing. And people know the difference. I think um, at the heart of most of this is that what people really, really want is authenticity. They don't, when they go there, they want there to be some there there. And I think the there can change. And I think we've got to make decisions with a very keen appreciation for the history and traditions that make places special and not waste that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, people are going to look back and they're going to say that these are the interesting times that need to be preserved. And um, so we can't be too uh, enslaved to the past. Um, this goes back to the your earlier question um, about COVID, but one of the changes of people leaving the workplace for COVID that relates to this is the question of um, segregation by wealth in this country. And if you go back to the Norman Rockwell small town image, the, the guy who owned the bank and the woman who kept the books for the bank and the guy who swept the bank out at night, um, they probably knew each other. They might have gone to the same church. Their kids likely went to the same school. And as a result, there was a very strong sense of community. If the guy who owns the bank is now telecommuting into the bank from 100 miles away uh, from his estate, there isn't the same buy-in to that community. And we've got to be careful about how um, we manage this increasing um, wealth geographical stratification where rich people only see other rich people and middle-income people only see other middle-income people and poor people see only poor people. One of the nice things about Rhode Island, although there are some obvious exceptions, is that we've stirred that up pretty well over time. Um, but I think that's a real concern. And I'll just throw in, because Scott, you've done such insightful writing on healthcare, that one of the good things about COVID has been telehealth, not telecommuting, but telehealth. And there were all sorts of obstacles to that. COVID broke through those obstacles, and I think there's no going back. Well, that's really interesting. One thing I was really very uh, gripped with in EJ's book is how you talk, uh, EJ, in Code Red about the trades and how you shouldn't have to go to college to have a middle-class life. My wife's a doctor, and she always says, look, if you call a plumber on a weekend, he or she is making more money per hour than your pediatrician. And so I'm wondering, how do we change the educational system to do a better job of giving people a choice of a skilled trade without going back, and you talk about this in the book, without going back to the tracking system where certain people from certain ethnic groups or the poorer kids in town uh, didn't get pushed into a college a curriculum. Uh, by the way, Scott, I think you actually framed that exactly right, uh, because it's how do you respect the work that is done by people who are not necessarily uh, college attenders without going back to tracking? Because we don't want to retreat into a world where we assume that a working class kid from a certain background just isn't going to go to college. Some of the most brilliant people uh, in our country, Ernie Moniz, your know, former uh, energy secretary, was a kid from Fall River, Dorothy High School, right. uh, became one of the smartest physicists in the country. We don't want to lose that. At the same time, I think, I, I don't know how much of my uh, love notes of Fall River got lost in the technological problem, but what I learned in Fall River was respect for working people, respect for working class people who went into a mill who didn't necessarily go to college. In many cases back then may have left school at eighth grade, but really worked hard to care of their families, took care of their neighborhoods and were really great citizens. And I think as a country, we have lost that sense of real respect all the way down. One of the things I write a lot in Code Red about is the idea of dignity and the idea of economic dignity. And I think when you look, a lot of people talk about Germany and Germany's quite successful model of apprenticeship and helping people find new skills and to move forward uh, in their work <laughs> lives. Um, I, my friend Ed Luce, who's been a foreign correspondent, he's British, he's spent a lot of time in Germany. He says, look, the, the Germans over in the post-war years have developed a real respect for working people and their contribution to society. And he argued that in the Anglo-Saxon countries by which he meant uh, U.S. and Britain, we had lost that. 
what I hope is all this talk about essential workers um, will suddenly lead us to say people who do work um, that does not require a college degree are people we rely on every day and we better start paying them decently and we better start respecting them. And I think that respect then leads us to look at that kind of work um, with uh, the honor it should get. And I think that can lead us to change uh, some of our policies, uh, education and training policies. You know, one of the things that we're seeing, I like this guy. Yes, Alice. <laughs> sure. So I would totally agree with what EJ is saying and just want to add that um, from our perspective here in Ohio, this is a challenge. I mean, everywhere is facing this challenge, right? But um, this is a, is a very acute challenge where um, college attainment rates are still fairly low, but also income is very low in the state. And what we're seeing is, um, to EJ's point, that that respect has to be matched with action in order to really affect that culture change around, around what we value. And so um, very small steps that I think are very significant, however, um, for example, there are now communities in Ohio where they have signing days. And so when you um, decide to go into the trades, the trades, um, they, will, they will have a signing day similar to what you would see for um, a, a, an athletic signing day with, you know, the banner behind you and, and balloons and it's streamed and, you know, their family is there. And that kind of um, uh, community um uh, you know, an external overt way for the community to celebrate kids going into the trades, I think it does more than just saying we need to respect these workers, right? And having those kind of small, but then of course, increasingly larger actual um, steps to moving forward actually makes that culture change occur to, because it's both that respect, but also, you know, it has to be in the air, right? You have to have um, folks wanting to 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 recognize truly that this is as um, EJ was describing in the Germany model, right, a very viable, respected path. One of the things that COVID nineteen has done, of course, is really put the stress on higher education. We see at the community college of Rhode Island, we're seeing at Rhode Island College layoffs, deficits, just getting slammed with a river of red ink coming into these budgets, and the states are, again, in deficit. The federal government shows no real urgency to do anything uh, together to help. And so I just wonder what's going to happen uh, to these real educational institutions, which is the social mobility fulcrum, the ladder, for an awful lot of people. You can't just raise tuition it seems there's going to have to be a new way of doing this. What are some of the ideas, Scott, that you have for trying to get through uh, COVID-19 uh, and focus on education? What can we do? Well, I think we've got some innovative models in Rhode Island about how to uh, do, do kind of non, non-traditional, non-traditional campus style education. There's the Westerly Education Center, for example, uh, which is a, a partnership between uh, government and business and, uh, and higher ed uh, that is uh, providing training um, uh, for very specific skills and for very specific industries. And I believe they're opening a branch, and Senator would probably know this in either Woonsocket or Central Falls in the near future. Uh, so that's that's part of it. I think, um, you know, I, I think... Uh, some of the more elite institutions, and I'm a graduate of one of them, they have a little bit of an edifice complex. Uh, and uh, that, that, has, that means that they've got a lot of capital to maintain, and maybe they've got to have a little bit of a reckoning about, about getting away from that edifice complex. Um, uh, and that, that isn't just for the elite schools. I think it goes beyond the elite schools. So I do think there's going to have to be some some belt tightening and some refining of how higher education operates. There's probably going to be a move to more online learning, which is, I, I would guess, less expensive uh, and, and less need for, for buildings. Uh, but also, I think the government is going to have to be more uh, helpful and aggressive uh, in uh, sustaining what is a key, as you said, a key fulcrum for economic mobility. And we don't have the economic mobility that many of our Western European uh, allies have, contrary to the sort of the mythology of America still being the land of mm -hmm. greatest opportunity. So anyway, those are those are some scattered. 
Well, some, I'm just wondering because we do have three uh, folks here, the senator, EJ, and you, Scott, who are all graduates of uh, Ivy League schools that have very, very large endowments. I'm just wondering, let's start with the senator. Is it right for a place like Yale and Harvard to be sitting on, or Brown, to a lesser degree, to be sitting on these huge endowments at a time like this? and not actually putting some of this money into the institutions and into helping uh, more folks with scholarships and get more than the 1% into some of these elite universities. We all know that there's just really not that much social mobility when it comes to the Ivy League nowadays and, so, and other elite institutions. Yeah, I think um, they have a big advantage because of their endowments in terms of responding to COVID. Um, you know, Brown, for instance, is going to be able to pay for a lot of support for its students to get through this period. going to be harder for Roger Williams and for Providence College and for Bryant. But interestingly, I think of all of them right now, Bryant may be doing the best job of all in terms of frequency of testing and low uh, response, low positivity rates while maintaining a campus environment. So it's not purely driven by uh, the wealth of your endowment. And the larger question you raise, Scotty, is the balance between um, institutions that I think see themselves as durable, that expect to be there 100 years from now, 200 years from now, and to carry on a particular tradition of, of education, liberal education, uh, respect for the classics and also social activity um, and uh, forward-looking social change. That, I think, is the balance that they have to make. And there are times when it's, you know, you got to go to capital and draw down to help the people who are there right now. Unfortunately, what that does is make worse the separation, the adv advantage-disadvantage between those who go to schools that have a huge endowment and those who go to schools that are really struggling to figure out how to survive this. Could I just say things, a quick shot that, of that course. the way there are a couple of ways you can cast that question. The way you cast it is perfectly fair. These are really rich schools with these big endowments, and shouldn't those endowments be shifted elsewhere? That's not an unfair way to ask the question, but implicit in that is the idea that the money to do what we need to do to preserve and lift up community colleges should be shifted out of one education sector to another. Uh, are the endowments of those uh, elite schools better used, as Senator Whitehouse suggested, um, to expand access to poor kids? Should we call on those elite schools to do more for their communities, but find resources elsewhere uh, to lift up community colleges? Because I am, you know, I saw in Fall River, my mom was head of the, was on the board of our local community college, what those institutions can do for upward mobility is really extraordinary. So I really want to make sure they are protected through this whole period. I'm not sure the ideal way is, uh, we're never gonna fund education the way we need to just out of taxing the endowments of the, few, the schools that have big ones. That's obviously true, but I'm still wondering how we do a better outreach to get more kids into schools. One of the problems we have, and I don't know what it's like in Ohio, but tuition for state schools keeps going up. Certainly if you go back 20 or 30 years, it was nearly free in a lot of places in this country to go to a state university. I went to one and, you know, very little student debt in those days. And that's all changed. And so we seem to really be putting a lot of debt, saddling these young kids when they get out of school with debt. And it's really tough for a lot of them. I wonder, Allison, in Ohio, have you had any new creative ways of dealing with student debt? Um, I wish we did. As someone who holds student debt, I wish we did. No. <laughs> um, one program that I do like in Ohio, though, is um, it's called Forever Buckeye, Ohio Buckeyes. Um, which is that if you are a graduate of an Ohio of a high school in Ohio, you leave, but you want to come back and do um, do college, uh, and that's anywhere from a bachelor's on up. Uh, you will be charged in-state tuition, right? So that is one way to mitigate the, that extraordinary cost, but also 
from um, from the state's kind of long term goals, we need to repopulate and strengthen our population and retain talent. And so, offering that um, that in state tuition, even if you are no longer you haven't been a resident for you know, however many years, is one small way. Um, this is certainly a challenge that all communities in Ohio and, and residents are facing. And you're right, community colleges are a great are a great um, solution, but it's not a complete solution by far. You know, aren't there some unintended consequences? I think it's important that I think it's important that we uh, recognize that uh, our governor, um, with the support of some of our other leaders, uh, has instituted free tuition uh, for uh, uh, for community colleges, at least to some extent. I don't know all the details, and uh, well, I think that's that's part of the direction we need to move uh, to combat. I guess- yeah, That's what I'm, I was going to talk about that, Scott, but it's great to have free tuition at the Community College of Rhode Island. It's a great move. However, there are unintended consequences, and one of them has been to cannibalize Rhode Island College, which is still charging tuition and yet has seen its student body uh, plummet because some of these students have chosen to go to the community college for free and not go to Rhode Island College, which is, of course is the oldest public uh, college in the state and for years and years has been really the fulcrum of first generation students who become teachers, yeah. nurses. And so I'm wondering how do we square that circle? Well, what's the goal? Is the goal to have, is the goal to have Rhode Islanders um, educated or is the goal to support a specific school? I mean, I would just say well, sort of the big picture. But EJ, well, I interrupt. Big... No, I, I mean, free community, you have already had a movement of students to community colleges because, as you said, Scott, we have over a period of time, and it really accelerated after the economic crash of 2008, where right. states right. all over the country uh, shove, uh, took away money that uh, was essentially subsidizing tuition. So the cost of going to public universities was shifted from the general tax revenue to students. So that's a problem that's been getting worse over a long period of time. Even before the community college became free, an awful lot of students were looking rationally and saying, I can go a lot in a, to college in a much less expensive way if I spend two years in community college and then transfer uh, into another institution for the last uh, two years. And so I think that, yes, free community college will accelerate that trend a little bit. Uh, but the real question is, do we want to give more support again to public higher education of all kinds or not. If we don't give that support, uh, we are going to have rising uh, student debt and we're going to have a real crisis in the system. I also if you could do, uh, go ahead. Okay, if you could do one thing, Scott, uh, to attack income inequality, what would it be? Scott Wolf, start with you. Yeah, no, I'm, I, it's, a, it's a critical question. A one thing. Uh, well, I think in the Rhode Island context, uh, to provide more affordable, uh, decent housing opportunities for people. Uh, a lot of people are really spending too much of their income, too high a percentage of their income on, on housing, and that restricts their ability to, uh, to move up the economic ladder. Allison, what would you do? I would do that. Um, I would also, and I say this personally, not representing Greater Ohio, um, I would say raise income. In Ohio, we have a lot of housing cost burden uh, residents, but our housing markets are extremely modest. So the issue really is that people are not earning enough money. Senator? Well, as a member of the uh, Senate Finance Committee, I'd say go back to a tax system where people who make more money pay more taxes instead of the tax system right now where the people who make the most money often pay the least taxes and in fact often none at all they're complete billionaire freeloaders on the rest of uh, the economy ej 
Um, I'd start with a big expansion of the child, child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. In a sense, it's the flip side of what Senator Whitehouse just said, uh, because I think we can lift up a lot of families um, who are very hardworking families. And I think we also have to do a whole lot of other things on uh, income inequality. But I think we could really uh, take a big chunk out of child poverty uh, if we built on those programs. Uh, and, and ending child poverty has to be one of our central goals if we want to move forward as a country. Do you think the Canadian system, something like family allowance, is something we could ever get approved in the United States? Senator? Um, I don't know at the moment. We have so many other uh, fights. Um, but I do think that if there is a political shift in November and um, we have new leadership out of the Oval Office and perhaps new leadership in the Senate, you will see a very, very robust effort to address the problems that EJ was just talking about. This has been held back for way too long, and the system has been run unfairly for way too long, and there are a lot of very good ideas out there that can overall expand America's economy while making it fairer. And we just haven't looked yeah. that way because special interests have had too much control. That will end potentially um, next year and look for really powerful legislative efforts in Congress on that if we're given the chance. As um, Winston Churchill said to Franklin Roosevelt, give us the tools and we will do the job. <laughs> <laughs> See, my, favorite Churchill, my favorite Churchill quote about Americans is Americans always do the right thing after exhausting all of the other possibilities. Right. We are in the exhausting all the other possibilities phase. Let's hope we get to the other phase. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my clock's running down, and I think uh, I've bothered you folks enough. Thank you all this morning for such a great panel, and I want to thank Scott Wolf again for getting me involved. The second year I had Jim Fellows, and now welcome my old friend EJ back, and we do want to really oh, root for you. Oh, it's always good to see you. Uh, you know, the only bad thing is we're not in person because Bob Kerr and Paula wanted to uh, get in touch with you. I know Give you them know them. Big hugs for me if one can, uh, if you oh, wouldn't oh, mind doing that. Uh, of yeah. course, no, we have yeah. one show. Uh, while you two are going over Sunday. all your old times together, we need to close with a big thank you to Grow Smart for the amazing yes, we work do. that it does in our community. Yes. Thank you very much, and Scott. Thank you. Thank you.